Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. Today, I have with me Alicia Embleton. Great discussion that we're going to have on child development. Sweet spot for those ages six to seven up through teenage years. I think we're going to have a really great and fun conversation. Off here, we're going to join ourselves. If you want to know more, there'll be a link in the description to her book on Amazon, uh, From Seed to Sapling. And welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. It's great to be here. Awesome. So what's uh, talk to us a little bit about this childhood development piece in general. What's your regular work? And then we have uh, three core topics that we'd like to go through today. Yeah, of course. So the childhood development work that I focus on is helping children to really sort of navigate that transition time in their lives where things are starting to change and open up and evolve. You know, they're moving from being a that early childhood where they are just all of themselves and uh, just focused on learning and adapting and finding out all of what the world has to offer them. Um, and I, it's just amazing watching them at that age. But then they start moving into that primary school, middle childhood phase where the world starts becoming bigger than just their family cohort. And they start having these external sources that start to mold and shape who they are as a person. And then this entire new world is there that they're trying to navigate and work out how do they still maintain who they are? How do they, you know, face all of these new challenges and stresses and, you know, all of these new things that are starting to come into their space? Um, and then obviously they hit the teenage years and so long as they've had that really fantastic support through that childhood stage up to the teenage years, then we've really set them up to be able to succeed in life. And so the focus of my work is doing exactly that, working with children to help them be set up ready for that, you know, future success as an adult. Love it. Uh, the three core topics of this are resiliency, authenticity, entrepreneurial spirit. I know we're going to get into more after this. So let's let's discuss developing resilience in our sons and daughters. Uh, probably you mentioned sort of three core areas. I want to interject. Well, you mentioned two. I'm going to interject a third. I figured there's that early childhood area, the six, seven, eight. Then I think there's puberty and then there's uh, going to become a teenager. So like uh, preteen. I'd yeah. love to kind of hit those three for each of our topics. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and exactly what you were saying, you know, resilience, authenticity and entrepreneurial spirit is very much how I have been able to sum up what are those fundamental pieces that we really need to bring back to our parenting to be able to set these children up for that future success, um, you know, to be able to have that really sort of thriving, fulfilled life that they all deserve. Love it. So Let's talk about resilience in specific. So what are, so what's resilience? How do we define it? How do we see it as a parent? Yeah, of course. So resilience, um, the way I like to define it is it's about really supporting your child to develop that capacity, to develop those skills so that they can actually remain balanced in all facets of their life. So this really looks to talk through things like coping strategies, um, you know, how do they deal with stress, understanding what stress actually even feels like for them in their bodies and how do they sort of notice uh, those early signs so that they can then start to be able to handle these sorts of things. You know, how do they bounce back from those adversities where things are a little bit more challenging? Uh, you know, how do they sort of really look to... I guess, navigate those times with the right approach to how they can, their mindset for it, really. Um, you know, I, I very much see resilience serving as that cornerstone that we have in, in sort of really navigating life's challenges and the setbacks and being able to actually empower the children to bounce back, to be able to learn, to be able to sort of grow from adversity. Um, and as parents, being able to cultivate that resilience in our children um, is helping them to develop that sort of that inner strength and that adaptability uh, to be able to sort of face those obstacles, to be able to have that determination 
So, you know, it's it is very much things that are, are things that as adults we actually do without necessarily even being conscious of it. Uh, you know, we might have coping strategies that we've learned over the years that are just such a natural thing for us that we're not even aware that these are, are, are things that we actually need to bring more consciousness for our children so that they can learn that these are, are real effective tools for them. What do we look for in our children to show that this is an opportunity for them for growth? That like it's a behavior that we'll see or a, or sentences what are these signals that they're sending to us so that we can perceive them as feel good fathers to know here's an opportunity for coaching, correction, encouragement, etc. Yeah, of course. So look, I think there are many different kinds of signals and it is going to be different for every single child. Um I, I think what we need to be looking out for are signs of those sort of challenges, signs of the stress. So for a lot of children, um, what we would actually initially see is that we will actually see them starting to fidget. So it might be that they fidget with their hair. They might, you know, little fidget spinners, whatever it might be, but we'll actually notice fidgeting as one of the first external things, external signs in being able to see some of these manifestations in children. And so it's understanding what those triggers are for your child. And it's going to be different for every single person. Um, you know, for some, it might be picking the fingers. For some, it might be fidgeting with the hair. It's going to be really different. But it's it's the, bringing that. It's the, the signals of discomfort, right? It's the things yeah. that we actually perceive where if we're attentive to these, and, and not everybody has developed this, uh, but if you're looking at somebody and they're, um, I think there's like, there's like kind of, shine like shine your head this way uh if for those watching i kind of tilted my head and showed sort of like only one cheek to kind of protect the other cheek was one there's um uh there's uh, uh alicia for those that were are listening as well she was kind of pulling her hair down she has she has this lovely long hair and so she's kind of pulling it down sort of like uh that was kind of a, a coping skill to see that that women uh frequently do with their hair when they're uncomfortable and there's other simple signs like that uh, the thing that's coming to my mind here is there's so much sensitivity for, um, I guess, North American based uh, parents to the ADHD, ADD thing. And the first thing in my head was, oh, my goodness, like these if if this is true and this is just an emotional coping mechanism, which I understand because emotions for children are physical things. They manifest physically because they don't have the same mental development that, that an adult would that of course it's going to manifest in some sort of fidget or action. Like it just makes sense that that's true. Uh, neat. Mind blown. Okay. Fidget. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think the other thing that we would probably notice as parents and we, again, it's probably something we've not ever really put that two and two together is we'll sit there and we'll be thinking that, Children are just that you know they're just naturally a little bit more warrior, you know, a little bit more of a worried person, or you know they just they're acting out a little bit more, whatever that might be. Those again are actually those sorts of signs that we need to be looking for. So things that we might just be putting down to a personality trait as well, even um, can actually be signs to help us as parents being able to to notice these triggers for our children. And then we can bring that self-awareness to the, the um, you know, the space for the child and being able to learn these sorts of things as well. I, I love this one in particular because I, what I find and what I perceive out in the world and on occasion, I'll own up, you know, I sometimes dismiss the worrying of my 11 to 12 year old. Uh, but, it, you know, when I'm attentive and pain and at my best, which I hope is most of the time, I'll hear something and I'll say, wait, what did you mean by that? Or can you tell me a little bit more about what you're saying? Because while from my perspective, it might not be something, you know, I've got the bills, I've got the job, I've got the house, we got to do chores, we got to prepare dinner, the baby's crying, this is, oh, ah. life, is, life is getting pretty crazy. And then your 11 or 10 year old is like, you know, I'm really worried about the tree outside. 
you know, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know, what do you mean? I know that was kind of an absurd example. However, they're expressing, I'm concerned about something or it bugs me when this happens or something like that. Uh, to just kind of, I, I know for the feel good father way, it's about leaning in and saying, Hey, Hey, I'm listening to you. What, what do you mean by that? And, uh, what, what would you suggest in that, in that scenario? Love it. Love it. I, I keep the more and more we're having this particular conversation and I'm thinking about this resilience. I keep thinking about that statement that, uh, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Haidt, uh, um, the calling of the American mind. And it, it, it's effectively that because we've digitized a youth experience, they're no longer doing other activities that have historically for the entirety of human existence has created a more resilient person in general. And that's yeah. simply uh, the concept of this. Um, as a as a child, and what I've done specifically with my daughters, uh, well, with my oldest, my youngest is like eighteen months, so it doesn't matter there. But for uh, work in progress, exactly. She's not. She can't take on much responsibility, but she can follow commands. So, for instance, uh, one thing we have her do is like, hey, part of it is like learning association so hey that ball or that toy can you go pick it and bring it here so she's so part of that is just kind of building the skill set of there are things over there that i can pick up and then bring it over here so it's like a multi-step command anyways uh for the oldest i remember it's about showing her that the safe risks so for instance we're in a new area and she's now climbing trees and the first, the first thing for me was, well, there's a lot of construction going on. So there's lots of other things going on, all this kind of stuff happening. Yeah. And then my first reaction was like, don't do that. It's too dangerous right now. I can't do that. Like, please don't. And then I, and gratefully, I did not say that. And what I said instead was excellent. I want you to be careful because of all the construction. However, I just want you to show me where the tree is. Just show me where the tree is because I love the fact that you're doing it. And so we went for a walk. And she actually showed me and she climbed the tree and I was like, oh, like you're four feet off the ground. Everything's fine. You know, it's a relatively safe area, all this other kind of stuff. But it was that controlled small risk that's building her confidence. Exactly. Right? And I think this is a, uh, I'll be quiet in a second. <laughs> it's like a the small step of building her resilience and confidence by allowing her throughout. And there's been multiple situations where layering on the chores, layering on the responsibility, giving the free reign. Like now I don't even, now we have, she has neighborhood friends. It's like, Hey, just, you know, you gotta be home before nightfall. Like <laughs> this is kind of the rule. Like just, just go, can I go? Yes. I don't care. Just go, go have fun, get in the trouble, go get dirty. We'll change your clothes. We'll have a great dinner when you come home, have, have a great time with your friends. Like life is peachy yep. kind of thing. Um, continue. Oh, <laughs> so. I, Completely agree with you. You know, I'm I'm very much in the same boat. You know, my stepsons they'll very much you know they'll they'll head out, off they go, they run around, they do their thing, and it's kind of understanding how much of that is my fear and anxieties being projected onto them, 
versus a what is actually a concern for them. And so it's being able to understand who's actually the one that has that concern at the point in time. Definitely, you know, if they're up on some big giant tree and there's a high risk of them falling, we need to be considering those sorts of things. So, it, but yeah, it's very much understanding how much of it is us also projecting uh, versus something that, and where we need to be really careful of and conscious with this is our children are going to be learning from our, model, from our role modeling. So if we're freaking out and saying, oh, you shouldn't be climbing that tree and you shouldn't be doing this and, and, and freaking out about whatever it is that they're wanting to do, they're learning that that's actually a really scary thing. Mm. And they're then not going to want to go and climb the next tree because they're freaked out that climbing trees are scary because I've just, I've just learned that from my parents. So it's being able to really understand and give them as much autonomy within that controlled risk space. Love it. Absolutely love it. And I think that, that's super great. I don't think there's anything to add. That's, that's wonderful. Let, let's talk about authenticity. Let's, let's move on to this one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Authenticity is a big one. Um, obviously, it's probably one of the hardest ones, if I'm being completely real. Um, it's, it's the hardest out of the three for children to be able to, to navigate as they continue to grow. Um, the earlier in that sort of, you know, early childhood and even in the middle childhood in that early sort of stage, the earlier and the younger that they are, the easier it is for them. Um, as that world continues to expand to bring such an external focus to it though, and so that could be through social media connections as they start creating their own accounts. That could be through, uh, the engagement with their friends at school, that could be through the new friendships that they then start making through the extracurricular sports or, you know, whatever that might be that they're doing outside of school as well. You know, the the friends in the neighbourhood and, and all of these sorts of things. But as that external world starts to expand further and further, that's when authenticity becomes more challenging for them. And that's when as parents we need to really sort of step up and help them to continue what they already naturally knew as a younger child. Authenticity is a natural thing for us that we then unlearn as we continue to grow up. So it's being able to help them bring that back. Um, you know, I guess authenticity can mean many different things to many different people. Um, for me personally, my definition is that it's really about being you know, your true self and really holding true to what you value. Um, you know, it's it's being able to, I, I guess the thing that I love the most about authenticity as well is that it's something that will cut universally across different cultures, different backgrounds, different, you know, it, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what arrangements you've been brought up in authenticity is still available and it is still something that is there. That sounds a lot like personal identity. sounds a lot like personality. It's a, you know, when you're talking about friend groups and social media, right, there's a, a performative aspect, especially when you get to the online spaces yeah. uh, within peer groups, people are trying to fit in, find their people who they like, who they dislike. Uh, and that comes from a natural, right? Our, our, you mentioned earlier on, our kids are parroting us. They're looking at our behaviors, looking at our reactions. And so they're, they're learning who they are through the way that we treat them and the way that we react to them. And then also they're learning that new thing by how are they getting some sort of reaction by their peer group as that's going on. What, uh, same thing, like what would be the behaviors and, and stuff like that to watch out for? And then what would be sort of the um, encouragement to kind of build more authentic expression? Yeah. Look, I think very much this, in the same sort of vein as resilience is going to be different for every single child, authenticity triggers are going to be something different that you'll notice uh, show up in different ways. I think what we really need to be paying attention to is when they're doubting themselves is Authenticity at its core foundation is that self-trust. And so 
as parents, I think the easiest way for us to be able to identify some of these authenticity uh, options for us to be able to help our children is to be looking out for when that self-trust is starting to erode a little bit. So that might be that they, and it could be really minor things like, well, I'm, I'm not as good as maths as, you know, Joe Blow in the class as well. You know, they're so much better than I am. But what are you good at? Like you have natural strengths. It may or may not be maths, but what are your natural strengths? And helping them to really understand who they are um, because not everybody is the same. And that is what is so amazing about this world. I love the I, I love the the focus on what you're good at, what you're not. As things develop, you know, I, I I think a lot about the socialization of boys and girls, right? There was one thing I remember. Uh, my daughter was really young before this is before pre K, so she was very young, and we were living in Florida at the time, and she was already called dear and honey and all these kind of things. And don't do that; it's too hard. When she was like three and four, it's like come on, like. Maybe she's a bit rough and tumble and my, and my oldest is a bit that way. That's, she's just a little bit more, uh, she's just as comfortable in a pink tutu as she is in a leather jacket. So Which she's is got, fantastic. yeah. And she's got this, this great expression, this great idea about who she is and what she's developing and she's learning different things as she's, as she's getting there. But I, I, I can't imagine the, the, the quelching of that, of that personality. Like, so in effect, I love the self-trust. I love the idea of the doubting themselves is really what we're looking out for. So what do we, what can we be careful of? Cause I'm, I'm having trouble thinking about this one. Uh, it's something that I, I, I pay a tremendous amount of attention to is personal yeah. identity and personality. Um, what, what can we help feel good fathers look out for or say to kind of encourage more authentic, um, more authentic identity and trust. So I think the, biggest thing that we can do as parents in being able to encourage that authenticity is really helping them to understand what are their natural abilities, what are their natural strengths, what what is it that is their, you know, in essence, their, their genius zone, um, you know, what really works well for them and understanding and helping them to understand that that's what is fantastic as their list. You know, that's their world of expertise. But if they were to look at their friend, would their friend be the same? They probably wouldn't be. They would have a different uh, sort of, you know, area of expertise. And so it's being able to help our kids understand that even when they do start comparing, because we can't stop them from doing that, that is something that is, again, a very natural human trait that will happen is that they will be comparing themselves to all of the, the people in their peer group and even the ones that aren't um, in their friendship group necessarily, but they will definitely be doing that comparison. And it's being able to help them see that every single one of those children has something unique about them and that's what makes them who they are. But none of them are the same. You know, there might be a lot of similarities as they get closer to those teen years, um, you know, they do start to conform a little bit and, and, and do mold a little bit more into clicks, but it's still very much helping them to see that every single child is different and that what is unique for them is what's going to make them the most special because no one else in the world can bring what they have to bring. And that's what's going to really I guess, have that amazing impact because no one else can do what they can do. I think this is fantastic. Uh, what a great, what a great focus for the feel good father and, and mothers out there to just pay attention to where your kids naturally fantastic, get curious about that and then cultivate that. I think, um, I think of kids as bonsai trees in this analogy, in this context, <laughs> right? We're, I love that. Uh, I, a regular bonsai tree looks like a bush, but if you cultivate it, you prune it, you cut back, you grow different things, you, you do different elements, it'll, it, they always look beautiful with any sort of, uh, of effort. Uh, entrepreneurial spirit. Let's talk about this. Yeah. And I think one thing I'll just add on authenticity and 
their their natural abilities that's just come to mind is it's not even necessarily just what their strengths are it's what are their areas of interest and passion as well we just need to be paying attention to all of those sorts of facets because we can develop our skills and strengths in things um it's that area of interest and passion that's really going to create that uniqueness for them um added on to that yeah this is the direct uh if you're you mentioned curiosity before if you lean in with curiosity and you're not projecting uh it's it's common for parents to project and want certain things for their kids because uh, there is a certain sort of cultivation but then just saying hey where are their natural interests i i love that too i think that's really um and for the feel good father that's really being able to eliminate your ego and just know that in this moment you're looking at them and specific, specifically what they enjoy not necessarily what you want them to enjoy exactly as challenging as it might be because we want our kids to succeed in life it's it will be a success for them if we can help them to find what they enjoy Got and with what's passionate for them excellent yeah so entrepreneurial spirit let's do it yes so i very much see entrepreneurial spirit is that mindset it's a mindset around innovation. It's about creativity. It's that, you know, perception of failure, that risk taking. Um, you know, it's it's that mindset around where situations are being approached dynamically and being able to to demonstrate that resilience and that unwavering commitment that they have to those specific goals. Uh, you know, it's really around viewing mistakes as those stepping stones in learning and in growth and in development because there is no such thing as a mistake then it's simply a, a learning opportunity and it's really that mindset that we need to sort of foster um, in our children so that they've got that curiosity that that problem solving ability um, you know really being able to lay that foundation for them for that future success um in no matter what it is that they look to do thereafter awesome so creativity risk dynamically adjusting curiosity unwavering commitment a uh, big big concept so a lot how there. i have yes a lot there uh how how do we cultivate i think creativity that's something that i've i've been very interested in in, in cultivating and i i Remember when I was young, I used to work at a, a summer camp. Uh, this was in college. And so I was a team lead and my specialty was uh, middle school, high school, and then a little bit of the college years. And um, most of us lose all sense of creativity by the time we're adults. I think we maintain like 5% of the creativity we had as kids, as adults. Uh, so how do we, uh, or what would you suggest that we do to continue to cultivate creativity? And you're, you're very much spot on. Uh, there is, I'm trying to think of the actual statistics, but there's a particular story that I remember reading. Um, it was something by Richard Von Och, uh, in his book, A Whack on the Side of the Head. And he was talking about this, in essence, an experiment that they did. Um, and they had a group of kindergarten children and they had a, a year 10 group of students. And they did the exact same thing with both sets of children. The kindergarten kids, you know, the teacher went up, they drew a, a chalk dot on the blackboard and asked the kids, what do you see? And as you can imagine, there were all sorts of amazing responses. You know, there was a squashed bug, there was an owl's eye, there was all sorts of incredible creativity coming out of these kindergarten kids. And then they did the same thing with the year 10 students. Chalk dot on the blackboard, what do you see? A chalk dot. The end. It is actually a proven fact that our ability to be creative and that, that real sort of thinking outside of the box deteriorates with age. And so, it, yeah. I'm, I'm curious on this one because uh, I'm, I'm not – I'm not terribly convinced that it, it deteriorates with age. There's lots of musicians and artists that continue to 
show up in the world. And yep. I'm, I'm sure we all have, we call it the woo woo creative spiritual person in our life. That's like, we'll take one concept and go into whatever it happens to be very creatively. Or, uh, you know, I made video games for a, a lot of years. So I worked with very passionate, quite creative adults that would take images yeah. from a paragraph or in their head and translate that into the paper, what we would consider traditional artistic creativity. Uh, I'm kind of curious on your opinion is how much of that literally comes from the desire to be right? Because this, our school systems typically reward the correct answer, not an incorrect answer. And so the moment you said 10th year, I was like, oh, you know, by the time you're in 10th year, especially if you're a young boy, you've been told, no, don't do that. That's not right. Tons of times. If you're a girl, no, don't do that. That's not right. Tons of times. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious if the expression of that creativity, you know, going back into resilience, going back into authenticity is a reaction. Like the killing of that is just a reaction to a bunch of adults telling them that they can't think that way. It's exactly it. In my personal opinion, that's exactly what it is that is happening. Um, unfortunately, our traditional education system and the the patterning and the societal expectations, you know, all of these things that they are learning through this journey um, is that, yes, by the time they reach year 10, they have learnt what they need to be doing. They've learned what's right. They've learned how they will, how they perceive they will then get ahead in the world. And so they are reciting back what they think is actually being requested of them. And that to me, I, I personally am of the opinion that we have that creativity the entire way through, but we unlearn how to connect with it. And so we need to actually maintain that connection, which to me is exactly why we see some of these incredible musicians and incredible artists is that they don't unlearn, they act, they maintain that connection and they keep honing their craft and they continue to be able to tap into it and to develop and to expand that creativity as they continue to age. Um, and that is where they become so incredible at, whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and so that's the part that I really want to be able to, as parents, for us to be able to help our children to do as well. And so I think we need to identify what it is that's actually a creative interest for them. You know, what is that outlet? And helping them to maintain that connection to that creative uh, outlet for them. My daughter has her first biographical project due and she's been working on it yep. and she's doing Van Gogh. Um, I've, I've been saying Van Gogh, but I, I don't know whether that's presumptuous or not to pronounce it that way. Um, I always grew up with Van Gogh in any case. So she has artistic talent yep. and she showed me and it was, it was quite good. She showed me what she'd been drawing and um, uh, for, for a long time viewers of the show, you, you might remember the old owl I had in the background. Uh, that was one of her paintings when she was like four or five. So she's had this thing and, and we've been cultivating her, her creativity in this, in this capacity. And so she was drawing uh, the sunflowers. Van Gogh is very known for sunflowers and then starry night. So she, we, she kind of created this penciled collage of all the different, of, of these famous paintings, right? Um, yeah. Probably didn't go to the blue period, but that's okay. Right. You know, <laughs> that's incredible. <laughs> And the details that I saw now, of course, it's impressionist painting. So uh, I guess I'll just kind of go. So impressionist painting, it's not known for fine line details. Uh, so this is kind of where you're seeing more. It's a it's a full brush stroke. I, I don't know if the feel good father listening right now understands art history or this time period. So I'm going into a little bit. So pre in the impressionist period, everything was very uh, hard line drawn. So paintings were actually drawn on canvas first, and then they were painted over afterwards. This is why you saw huge wall spanning collages, uh, typically because the only people that could actually afford to have paintings done in the romantic and then the neoclassic era were actually royalty, uh, and Kings, Queens, emperors, that kind of jazz. So you didn't see a lot of like private painting like you see today. So you would just see murals that would fit on a castle wall, right? Uh, the most common example is the uh, the crowning of Emperor Napoleon, super famous neoclassical painting. 
incredible detail. If you ever get a chance to go see it, incredible detail. Uh, you move forward to an impressionist world and it's more, you want to move away from the painting and get back from it to kind of understand the collage of what you're seeing. Uh, you know, if you ever get a chance to see like a Manet or a Monet or something like that, and you're looking at it, like you might get really close. You're like, okay, it's a blue blurb, you know, in a white spot and you don't really understand it. But then you move back and you're like, oh, it's a pond. Okay. I get it. <laughs> that was a lily and a flower and the water. Uh, so she had this combination of the starry night with some of the details that comes in with the sunflowers. Don't worry. We're going to bring it around to creativity in just a minute. So she turns <laughs> to me and she's like, great. hey, show me, show me what you've done. Like, or she was like showing me, hey, dad, what do you think about this? And I came over and I try and approach it more from a growth mindset. I'm trying to be very conscious of not saying, oh, you did a great job or, oh, that looks beautiful or things that are fixed and more saying, wow, I can see you've really put a lot of effort into it. I think it looks great. So the fix part can be from what I think, right? I think that's the ownership of me providing the, the um, compliment. And then the, I can see you put a lot of effort or I've been watching you put a lot of effort into it. It looks good. Or, hey, I know you've been practicing your drawing a lot since we moved here. Like she's been drawing consistently for a year and that kind of jazz. So the, the fostering of that, I don't even remember why, why we started this. I got lost in the story, <laughs> a little bit about art history, but creativity, um, it, it's really good. I, uh, for the feel good father, um, in this particular piece, and then we'll kind of, we'll round this out. I think that there are two core activities that are really, really fantastic for young kids. I'd love to hear Alicia, what your perspective is on this. I number one, think regardless guy or girl that they need a physical activity. Archery, martial arts, sports, doesn't matter. Gymnastics, it doesn't really matter. It's the use of your body and the development of your body and the, and the mind-body connection. And then the secondary piece is some sort of expression, whether that be uh, uh, traditional art, music, um, anything like that, in addition to regular play. So in addition to regular activities and extracurriculars, what, what are your opinions on that? Oh, I completely agree. And just for what you were saying around your daughter and the drawing that she's doing, you know, I think it's fantastic. It's not just a good job. You're, you're actually taking that further. And that's the, the key piece in being able to help foster some of that creativity um, as well. You know, instead of just saying, that's fantastic, really great job, being able to go, I love how you've used the color in that particular one. I love the shading that you were doing there. You know, picking out what it is that actually made it so amazing. So I think that's fantastic. Great. I love it. Love, um, love it. Uh, I'll have to go and look at one of the older uh, recordings so that I can see the the picture that used to be in the background there. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of, yeah, it'll be probably in the first 10 or so, I think. Yeah, perfect. Uh, yeah, I love it. I love it. Hey, more listeners. Yes, that's great. Uh, <laughs> what, I was very, very interested when you said unwavering commitment. And and this, this I think, as a concept, it's... It's, it's kind of related to that. Uh, I think one of the big struggles for me is that in this time period, right? My eldest is 11 turning 12. So she's about to hit that teenage preteen personal identity tier. Yep. There's a concept of, for me, there's, okay, do you understand your familial identity? Like who we are as a unit? Do you understand who you are and how you contribute to that unit? Uh, so that you understand what this is so that it's one kind of leg for your stool as you, mm -hmm. as she moves into this next tier where she's developed in this other leg for her stool, which is class, society, sports, extracurriculars, all of the other activities. Uh, but commitment to me is very related to that. Commitment to me is very related to pride, is very related to um, consistency, is very related to uh, discipline. Uh, at least, uh, you know, from my perspective, I let, let's talk about what you mean when you say unwavering commitment and, and how that definition is, we can play that out. So I think, I think you've actually nailed it there though. It's that consistency. You know, you can look at any kind of piece of research, anything around habits about being able to learn something new, being what, whatever it is, consistency is that foundation that everything will stem back to bring that consistency to keep trying again, to keep practicing, um, you know, that is really what's going to create that success is the consistency. How do we, and I think that for Feel Good Fathers, this is a particular interest, I think for all parents, not only for the FGF community, but also for, for parents of 
we know consistency of the correct habits creates that change. It creates success. And we want our kids to be successful in however they define it. Yeah. When that, when they're young though, they don't want that. They don't want that. Nah. So, <laughs> you know, and you're a specialist in the six to seven through 12. So what, what should we be looking up for? How can we encourage this behavior? I think it's going to be challenging for any child in getting them to find that commitment unless it's something that is an interest and a passion of theirs. So, again, that comes back to helping them to understand what are their interests and passions and where their strengths are. And then for the things that are less of interest to them and that they still need that commitment for, you know, be it. Um, you know, particular school class or, or whatever that is. It's then being able to help them find the fun in what is, in their mind at least, not fun. So what is that one thing that they actually did enjoy? And that will help them showing up and bring that consistency. They might still not enjoy wanting to be there. That might not be their first preference, but it will help them to bring that consistency if we can help them find well, what was the one thing that you could take away from that? Love it. Love it. This sounds very stacked, right? We're, we're first starting with uh, like a stacking, a stacking skill set. Yeah. You know, we're starting with resiliency and helping them navigate risk and navigate their emotions and learn a little bit more about themselves and be comfortable with whatever's going on. After that, it's about the parent activating or the father activating that curiosity and kind of leaning in and saying, okay, who is my daughter? Who is my son? How can I, you know, react to this uh, as a special aside? And for the father, she'll, you'll have to remember this from a previous conversation. There was a very particular moment where my eldest was very snarky with me, was picking a fight with me. And I just said, pause, you're being very unlike you. Let's sit down. We were about to go for a walk. Let's sit down. I really want to understand what's happening because this won't, this won't go. I was like, you're not going to treat me this way. So it was more of a, hey, let's sit down. And I just was quiet and she was explaining to me what was happening and we, re we resolved it. And then life was peachy after that. Life was really great. It was sons and sons and, uh, and pralines or not pralines, sons and lilies and the dandelions. That's the one. That's the flower I was looking for. Dandelions <laughs> in the field. So it was super great after that, but it, it required that moment of rather than rising to the energy of recognizing, oh, my daughter's not being her, her authentic self, which is this way, and then moving through that. And then finally, with this entrepreneurial spirit, it's like, okay, we have these two foundational elements here, and now we're going to move through the rest, and now we're going to uh, create more creativity, curiosity, and we're even commit uh, risk, risk taking, or risk taking spirit, that kind of jazz. Yep, um, exactly. And awesome. Yes, and. You're very much right. It is stacking all of these things on top of each other. And, you know, to, to go with the story you were just sharing about your daughter, the thing that comes to mind for me is that the bigger the emotion, the harder it is to actually interact with them in that point in time. And so exactly like what you were just talking to, sometimes we just need to pause, take a second, and then when things are a little bit calmer, we can actually come back in and work it through. But they are working through an expanding field of emotions through that time frame as well, as you have experienced <laughs> and as I have experienced with my stepsons. <laughs> Those emotional fields are continuing to expand uh, and they don't know how to necessarily handle them because these are starting to become new things for them. And so helping them to, to stack all of these fundamental learnings through that journey is actually then going to help them to have the resilience and that emotional regulation to be able to trust themselves. And that self-trust and that authenticity is also that being able to feel all of the, the good things and the bad things, but being able to really recognize all of what's happening for them. And then being able to build on that with that entrepreneurial spirit in, you know, they've got that understanding of who they are and being able to, to handle the challenges of life or what do they want to do with their life? What are their creative passions? What are their interests? And, and exactly as you say, we're, we're really stacking and building all of these fundamental things so that they've set up with these incredible tools in their tool belt to be able to navigate what comes ahead. Absolutely love it. 
thanks so much for sharing this. It's been, I think, a really great discussion into different character traits. Um, Alicia Ambleton, everybody. Thanks, Jay.